Good morning, everybody. We have a very special Fireside Chat today, and today is May the 4th, so... So, a little bit of Star Wars for you, um, and I also have uh, my Star Wars socks on. I have to show you guys this. This is my favorite part of uh, May the 4th. Is, uh, it's the Star Wars holiday. Uh, we have Star Wars socks. I don't know if you guys can see. I'll try not to fall off this chair. But we've got R2-D2 and we've got the Star Wars theme. So those are my Star Wars socks by Stance. Um, we're gonna go live today with Denise Tryon and Denise is one of my all-time favorite people, one of my all-time favorite horn players. And uh, yeah, we have um, a lot of memories together, a lot of stories together, and uh, yeah, thank you guys. So we're gonna do our live chat with Denise. Let's see if we can find her. Okay, uh-huh. Denise Tryon, is she DT Lowhorn? That's what we're, aha, there we are. I'm live with Denise. And we first met in Detroit back in, I think, 2009 at Carl Pittock's house. Hey, Denise. Hey. Great to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Hey, uh, your hair looks fantastic. Thanks. I was just trying to, uh, you know, keep up with you. <laughs> you know, it's just the corona. I mean, it's seriously like this corona style. I've never had this much hair in my life. Yeah, I, same for me. It's very long. So I thought, well, I'll just... Let's make it go insane. Let's see how high we can get. get exactly. <laughs> the tough. I was just recounting the first time we met in uh, mm. 2009. Uh, yeah. I was just telling uh, everyone that I think it was maybe like June of 09. I was in Carl Piddick's uh, house. You were practicing in the basement. And I yeah. remember like someone, uh, you know, I think Carl had said, oh, yeah, Denise is downstairs. And I was like, Denise, trying? Denise? And he's like, <laughs> Yeah, we're getting ready for uh, for uh, audition mode, and you know he's he's real soft spoken. I mean, I love I love Carl Pittick, one of the great yeah. horn players out there, and uh, your partner in crime in audition mode. So, yep. uh, can you can you tell that story when you walked up from the? Basement? So I walk up, yeah, and uh, and Carl's like, "Oh, Denise, I want to introduce you to Dave Cooper," and you were just like, your eyes just got as big as they could possibly get. I could see the whites all the way around. You're like, awesome. <laughs> and uh yeah <laughs> it's like okay it's nice to meet you <laughs> yeah. and then we were going to lunch because i was there so that we could rehearse for an upcoming recital and uh so we were going to lunch so carl says well dave do you want to join us you're like awesome i think <laughs> it's the only thing you said for the entire lunch the entire time <laughs> that's someone says here uh that's a great impression uh they're like very good oh oh no I think Tony Padilla says that's a good Carl impression. Well, I think you have an even better impression hey. of, of me. Yeah. I can't get my eyes as wide as you can. Yeah, yeah it's just like that. <laughs> there, we call those the high beams. And they're just, they're, you know, like when I'm really excited about something, the high beams nice. come on. Or if I have too much coffee. Um, hey. But the, the other thing, too, Cheers is like, to that. Mm. And yeah, oh, my gosh. You got a, a giant. What are you drinking there? Oh, my gosh. That is such a cool mug. That's a, yeah. a, a an octopus. Is it like handmade or is it just like a... Uh... Nope. That's just, I found it in the store and I liked it so much. I got, there were, it had two colors. So I got an, another color as well. So I'm drinking some tea to uh, get my day going. <laughs> to keep up with me. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, there's not enough caffeine in the world, nope. my friend. So we're going to, Muffy oh. always demands to be on. Okay, hold on. <laughs> This is this is the 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 Muffy segment of our of our chat. So Muffy, oh my gosh, who is there's this? There's Ozzy. Hi Ozzy. Oh, Ozzy. He who wants oh to my gosh. Yeah, he's baby. There. There's, there's, he's baby. six months old, French bulldog, and oh. very much interested in, in the window outside. Hi, you know, Jen Gunn is uh, our piccolo player, and yep. Jen has two Frenchies. Yeah, Jen's a good friend of mine, and uh, I was there in September, maybe? Yeah. Uh, no, August. I was visiting in August, and uh, yeah, we hadn't gotten the French Bulldog yet, and 
one of her one of her dogs was all over me so yeah it, it, so maybe jen was the reason that you got a french bulldog well i've been wanting a french bulldog for probably seven or eight years and it just hasn't you know that the house in philly it didn't have really any yard it wasn't quite it wasn't the right place so uh the house in cincinnati is is uh is the right place for a dog so yeah oh, that's that's awesome i'm yeah, pretty excited man. so yeah that's right we've hung out in detroit uh mm. you weren't there playing in detroit but then shortly after i came to philly uh just I, I think I was doing uh, Saratoga Springs or the Man Center. Yep. I yeah. Did, I remember like we did like West Side Story. Yeah. And it was one of those ones where I was like, ah, it's West Side Story. It's, ah, I've seen that movie. It's from the 60s. It, I don't even know. Oh that. my God. It's so hard. <laughs> and I like, and I like, I remember like I got the music. I was like, well, I'm playing with Philly. So I'll just look at the music. I was like, I had three weeks and I was like, oh, this is hard. This, this is hard. hard. This is really, really hard. And I yeah. only had to play half of it. Yeah. Yeah, that was like, that was for me. I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine having to play the whole thing. So this time, like, you know, we played it in uh, Chicago at Ravinia last summer. And I remember trying to get out of the second half. I was like, you know, last time I did it, I just played the first half. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, like, no. You want to split the book? And, and Dan was like, you know, I, I think this would be one I'd like to take off if you don't. I was like, yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. So no, but uh, yeah, your house in Philly, I just remember it was happy. Like it was like yeah. you'd color on the walls and you know, it was like, it was in that neighborhood from the uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie, I See Dead People. <laughs> what? <laughs> really? You, yes. You know that, that park, like they're like yeah. walking down, there's like the little park in the middle of the street. There's like, it's like this, yeah. there's like a street with no cars and there's like a garden in the middle, like a planter in the middle of the street. Yeah, yeah. And there are like, you know, houses on either side. And yeah. they, I think they walk down this, like this uh, sidewalk and there's the kid, I see a dead people. <laughs> <laughs> I never put that together, but I guess so. You got, go back and, well, I'm we gonna go back and watch. Go yeah. back and watch the uh, M. Night Shyamalan movies. They're all set in Philly. Yeah, nice. Do you miss anything about Philly? Like any like, you know, restaurants or any scenery or? Well, I miss the, the energy of Philly. I loved being able to walk out my door and within 10 minutes you had a dozen restaurants or bars that you could go to. Um, not that uh, we can do any of that now, but uh, you know, I miss the time when we could, I also miss the time when we could do that. Uh, but uh, that's uh, one of the things I miss about Philly. Of course, I miss my friends. I miss playing with the orchestra. It's a yeah. fantastic orchestra. Um, playing with that string section is like wearing a fuzzy, warm blanket. It's just, it's so amazing. Um, yeah, there are a couple of restaurants that I really loved. One was really close to the hall called Jose, Jose Pistola's. I love Mexican food. And so this is Mexican food. And um, yeah, it, it's one of the places that whenever I go back, I have to go there. Oh, wow. uh, and then there were a couple of places close to my house that, that I loved and really missed. And was one of our criteria when we were looking for houses in Cincinnati is we want to be able to walk 10 minutes and get to a little downtown, which we have. We have a cute little sort of main street type of thing where close to where I live. So, so you don't you don't necessarily have like the you know the, the Philly Max like the you know the no, good Philly no, is there, we is have, there any Mexican you know food yeah in? there's a Mexican place uh not actually two although I haven't been to one but uh about a 10 minute walk and you know it's it's not um how do I say this in the nice possible way uh it's not super like high end but it's really tasty and it's consistent and um it's just a it's real relaxed vibe so i like that okay. uh yeah we've got a great wine store near us we've got a couple of good breakfast places we've got some higher end things and some like sort of traditional diners so you, you got diners you got breakfast you got mexican i'm coming to cincy that's it <laughs> yeah no i i drove through cincinnati one time and i remember there's like uh canyon like it's i can't describe it any other way there's a river that goes through cincinnati <clears throat> excuse me and there are canyons on either side yeah like of this river like just like the river bank is rock and it's there's this big bridge that goes across cincinnati right and i just well, remember just, yeah it goes across the ohio river and it goes basically from ohio to kentucky 
So yeah. when you cross that river, you're in Kentucky, which is crazy to me that it's uh, it's Cincinnati's that far south. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I, it, when you think of Ohio, you just think of like neighbors with Canada, neighbors with Pennsylvania. Oh, right. Yeah, but not. <laughs> neighbors with Kentucky. <laughs> I guess that's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just, I got to hear about your journey to, uh, you know, Cincinnati, how you started off in, you know, um, Detroit, and then you went from Detroit to Philly. I mean, those are huge auditions to win. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then, of course, you taught at Peabody Conservatory, and then, you know, you're at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. Um, I, but first of all, before we do that, let's say hi to some people that are online. Awesome. So uh, if you just scroll through some of the names, uh, we can do some shout outs. Mm -hmm. We've got a bunch of people watching. Okay, so we've hi. got Lizzie Le the Cat, Sarah Ferenc, Andrew F. Music, um, Daniel Itzkowitz. We've got Lucas Horns. Yes. Yay. Yeah. Hi, Dan. We got yeah. Shona. Nice. Stephen Burian from, from Michigan, from the hey, uh, Detroit Opera Theater. Yeah. Yep. He was a friend of oh, mine. Hey, Jen Gunn is here. Hi, Jen. Bartek Trumpet. Uh, who else? That girl, Jayla. Hey, that girl, Jayla. We've got Jenny Benny. We've got Kaza0807. And let's see. We've got Evandro uh, Ivan. Uh, I believe Evo Andre Ferreira. I haven't gotten there. So, you know, honestly, like when you do these shout outs, that's like the, the worst, the worst thing is that like, you know, you're going to mispronounce the names. So we've got <laughs> Tony Padilla. Uh, Christina, Masher Turner. Hi, Christina. We've got some highs from uh, Japan. We also we have uh, Clayton Bobaton. Good morning. Yeah, Clayton. <laughs> Carl Pinnock is watching. Holy Hey, smokes. Carl. Carl, oh, did man. you like, uh, did you like David's impression of you? You know, the only, all right, so that impression is an impression of an impression. So that impression's from Haley, because Haley tells that story about um, Carl, working with Carl. We've got uh, Tech Horn. Uh, I, won't, I won't repeat the story because, you know, it, like Carl was going up for a solo and, and Haley, you know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so. You and I know the story, and so does Carl. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carl says it was such a great impression. Hey, and Christina says that Carrie and Christina are both watching. Hi, guys. Awesome. So uh, could you talk awesome. about the octopus and how you love octopus? And then we'll talk about your, your okay. journey to Cincinnati. All right. So a, a number of years ago, I used to say five years ago, but I think it's getting closer to 10 at this point. Um, my husband gave me an octopus uh, necklace. It's like a, it's pretty big. It's a cutout of a, a bronze cutout. And I used to wear it all the time. But, uh, and so I say it started with that. And he said, that's a really weird gift. I would not have given that to you unless you'd already been talking about it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so Apparently, I read an article or something, and they're just so incredibly fascinating to me. They have three hearts. Their blood is blue. Um, their suckers on their arms, their suckers are taste. Uh, the only thing that's hard on them is their beak, and so they can fit through a hole the size that whatever their beak can fit through. So you can have a huge octopus and have a hole that size, and the octopus can fit through it. So they're incredibly intelligent. They, they learn very quickly. And, uh, you know, jokingly, I sometimes wish I had eight arms so that I could slap people, eight people too. <laughs> no? That's, I think that's the real reason. That's it. You just wish you had eight arms. Amazing. Yeah, I hear they're like some of the most intelligent animals like on the planet. Yeah. They, they've got feelings and, you know, um, yeah. yeah, when they're, when they get bashful, they turn different colors. When they get excited, they turn different colors. Yeah, they can recognize people. And I don't know, it's, they're just incredible. And, and so I've really taken to it. And then I got one for my horn, which I have it sitting here in case. Yes. So I have one for my horn. Inky. Inky. Well, it's Octavius Inky Kling. So yes. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I have one for my other horn, but my other horn is at school. I haven't been able to get it. Uh, but yeah, so as, as soon as I started like having a couple around, people then just give them to me. So they are everywhere. Awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like, yeah, the octopus has kind of become your thing. It's your mascot. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, 
like everyone needs a mascot. I don't, I don't know what mine would be. We can, we can all mm. vote on that. <laughs> yeah, I think we should take a vote on that. <laughs> <laughs> Either Doug the dog from Up Squirrel, or, yeah. or Hamilton from Over the Hedge. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. I was, I was thinking. Uh, someone asks, uh, Fernando J R R sixteen asks. Um, hi, Denise. Do you have a lowhorn method or where uh, or can I have it? Greetings from Spain. Um, so I have basically, uh, I get asked this question a lot. You know, what do I do to make my uh, the low register of the instrument uh, be better? And the first thing I say is be sure that you're practicing down there. I mean, you know, it's amazing. I'll ask somebody, well, let's say you practice three hours a day. We'll just talk in round numbers tell me how many minutes you think you practice in the low register, you know, and they'll say, Oh, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes. And I'll say, okay, we'll turn that around. Let's say your high register is not great. And you only practice 15 minutes in the high register. And they're like, well, it won't get better. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. So part of it is whatever you're playing, it could be an etude. It could be solo stuff, could be excerpts, play it down an octave or two, just to work on it. And you'll learn different things. You'll learn how to how to make whatever it is that you're working on actually better, how to use your air a little bit more efficiency, efficient. And um, but then I have a warm up routine that I've done for many, 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 many years. And that is available online. So if you actually search Denise Tryon and routine, it'll come up and it's available online. So the PDF of it, but also it's a video of me playing each exercise and, and explaining why and how. And then there's also just audio of me playing it if you want to play along. Of course, I only play it in certain keys, and I recommend that you play it in a bunch of keys. But Yeah. So Vinny Carletti says, I need to practice everything <laughs> then. <laughs> uh, doing the routine right now, Clayton Bobaton. Yeah, Clayton. Um, four hours high, four hours low. So Woo, That's a lot yeah. of practicing would uh i mean eventually down the road maybe it'd be awesome for our um people if we could do like a live warm-up with you like an instagram takeover and yeah. you, do, you do a live would maybe down the road would that be something you'd be yeah sure in? yeah absolutely amazing yeah. i would really love that so we'll, we'll we'll talk about the details later okay um so could you tell us just i mean like you're known as like a real like proficient low horn player but i don't think of you as a low horn player i think of you as like a chamber musician, I think of you as a soloist, I think of you as an instructor, I think of you, yeah, you played fourth horn in Philly, but it's just something you can do. Um, how is it dangerous for us to classify us as like, you know, low horn players or high horn players? Yeah, I, you know, it's, I have a couple of different lines of thought on that. Um, I will say that somebody uh, recently, not recently, a couple years ago said, I think you need to stop marketing yourself as a low horn player. Uh, I think you're, you're limiting yourself. And, and my sort of thought is, yes, I can play Strauss one, I can go play Mozart Concerti. Um, but I think it would just be a, another voice that not necessarily a special voice. Um, and I'm a quite good high horn player. Uh, but I think that it's more beneficial for the audience and horn players to hear me play in the low register yeah. and to uh, show that you can have a beautiful sound and you can sing and make music in that register. And it's not just about showing like how muscly and strong you can be. So, um, so that's my first train of thought. Um, the second one is that, yeah, for a, for a long time, for many, many years, through college and through my time in the New World Symphony, I played high horn pretty much all the time. Uh, I played first horn in New World for the majority of, of all the pieces. And I was only taking high horn auditions, and I made it to the finals of a couple. Um, and then... I was reaching the end of my time at New World and I thought, man, I just have to start taking anything that comes up. Um, so I took fourth horn in Columbus, uh, Ohio, just up the road from where I am. It was my first low horn audition and I won it. Wow. Uh, and so I sat in that job for two years, but honestly, after a couple of months of sitting in that job, I thought, wow, I just, I love this. I loved being the baseline. I, I loved 
providing that foundation, um, that stability. And if you do your job well, it makes everybody else's job a little bit easier to figure out how to tune, to figure out how to just be stable. So I, I take my job very seriously and, um, and, I, and I love it. So that was, that's how that all started. Uh, and that's I don't know, 20 some odd, five, eight, I don't know, years ago. <laughs> I don't know, a long time ago. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think when we're in the horn section and we have a really great low horn player there, like that's kind of our, our bridge between the tuba and the low brass. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's kind of the bridge between the horn section and the low brass. Yeah. And really, it's the base of all the chords. I mean, it's so important to have a really solid bass line. You know, yeah. for the fourth horn, sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's, the, it's the, you know, fourth chair and i i mean i know horn players don't think that i know orchestral right. players you know know that but yeah it's not like you lost the chair challenge it's like you yeah, right like, right i just kept losing until i got to four i was like <laughs> where do i go from here next job is out um yeah it's so yeah it's you. it's interesting and 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 i will say that i'm I've had times when in my career where people have said to me, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just fourth horn, you know, it's easy. Um, you know, I actually had somebody say a trained monkey could play that. And I was like, wow, I, I'm really insulted right now. Because um, I don't think a trained monkey could do it. Let me be clear. <laughs> Maybe a trained octopus. I don't know. They're pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They've got the embouchure for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the beaker face. Yeah. Mm. So Jeff Nelson's watching. A quick shout out to Jeff Nelson. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. He's, we've Last been horn this. is all that matters. Yeah, baby. Jeff played fourth horn in Vancouver for a number yeah. of years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but I mean, um, Jeff, I mean, phenomenal low player as well as high player. But it's just, yeah, I think that's really great that you specify, hey, listen, I can do the other stuff. I really yeah. do this well, but it's because I spend time in it. And it's also because I feel it's very important. I take it seriously. Yeah, I care. Oh. I really care about the product that gets put out. Yeah. Um, and I think that anytime you pick up the horn, no matter what is on your stand, you want to play it to the best of your ability. There are some people who are like, oh, Pops, I don't take it as seriously. It's like, hey, Pops is harder a lot of times than other things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, some people don't like etudes. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it just doesn't matter. Whatever gets put on your stand, you try to play it the best that you can play it because I don't understand what my standards are if I don't take something seriously. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, okay, either all or nothing, right? And yeah. it's like, well, I'll pick and choose which ones I take seriously. And again, you know, I was a younger player when I, you know, got the, um, the music for West Side Story, you know, like earlier, yeah. earlier in the interview, I was talking about West Side Story yeah. and saying like, oh, it's a Pops concert, it's outdoors. But, you know, like, I remember, like, I did look at it. That's the difference is like, you know, in my mind, sometimes yeah. like as a younger player, you think, oh, Pops concert, like, hey, yeah. maybe I don't need to spend as much time on this as like Mahler 5. But, you know, yeah. what I learned from that lesson was that Pops concerts, I mean, number one, it's great music. I think yeah. West Side Story might be um, the greatest piece of American music. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can't think yeah. of another piece that's uh, that's actually better, like by an American composer. Um, I mean, except for Star Wars, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Star Wars socks on. I feel so uh, I, um, underdressed for the occasion. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know. Yeah, exactly. It's May the Fourth. <laughs> I know, yeah. but hey, I did actually put on makeup today, so you know. It's small miracles. I, I know, right? You know, for me, just putting on, you know, putting on real pants and real shirts yeah. and a real, real shirt. like a nice shirt. Yeah, okay. So, you know, that's uh, that's yeah. yeah for for us, like right now, it's just a matter of like uh, staying positive and and doing whatever yeah. we can to give back. How yeah. are you um, keeping positive during this time, and what goals are you having to kind of? You said you, everything you put on your stand, you take seriously. Yeah. And I think like, you know, that's kind of an attitude, just doing the best at whatever you do. I think that's just yeah. part of your personality. But, uh, you know, like, how are you keeping that up in this time of stay at home where you don't necessarily have the goals of, you know, concerts yeah. or, you know, recitals? It's been, it's been challenging mentally. You know, I'm not going to lie. And, and for a lot of this time, I've been 
teaching full time. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, created some structure to my day. And it's and it, I'm done now. It's been about a week, week and a half since I last did any teaching. Um, so that, but that did create some structure because Monday through Friday, I was, I was basically teaching from 11 to four or 11 to five. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I have another sort of rule that I always give to myself before I give to anyone else. Um, and you and I were texting before this and I said, I'm trying to get all my practicing in before we start. And you say, me too. So yeah. I was always, I'm, I was always when I was teaching in the practice room by 10, at least since the uh, stay at home orders have been happening. Mm. So I do. Um, and during that time, for me, the most important is if my face is feeling good, I'm mentally happy, and I'm more happy to be working on other things. And so I've that hour from 10 to 11. And I've continued that after after I finished teaching, because it was just a nice I like schedule. Yeah. Um, I'm a very routine person. Yeah. So I think routine uh, for me is really one of those things that if I can just get in a routine, get in a schedule, yeah. you know, just try to, you know, wake up at the same time, you know, try yeah. to hit my practicing first so I can, you know, do other things like, you know, have, you know, FaceTime calls to my family or right. friends, but yeah. Yeah, just hit that practicing first, get it out of the way, then do yeah. my workout. And then as, as soon as I'm done with that stuff, then it's like, okay, now I can, now it's variables, but the, the practice yeah. has to come first for me. It has to come first for me. Yeah. And I'm somebody that it doesn't seem like I would be this way, but I am like the best procrastinator on the planet. Um, I, you know, and I, and I have such, a... <laughs> <laughs> if you give me a choice between doing something else fun and practicing or doing a workout or, you know, something like that, I'm going to choose whatever TV, play with the dog just to hang out. Um, so I, I have to have that schedule and I need to do especially the, the playing first. Mm -hmm. So for me, I always start with um, one of my favorite books is by uh, uh, Joseph Schunkel. And uh, there's, uh, it's, in fact, I make all of my students play out of it. Do you have it there? Not, I have it. It's right <laughs> behind me. Okay. You got it? This is this is the Chantel book, right? Yeah. And it's backwards, but everyone can see right, right, right. C H A N T L. Yeah. So yeah, this is, and this the, is the book. The, the, green back book. Of, the back of that book, maybe the last eight or so pages, is just scale exercises. And so um, since we've been on on quarantine, yeah, since we've been on quarantine, I've been playing those. I start my day off after a little small, you know, three, four minute warm up. I start playing that and I play that all the way through. And then I play my warm up routine, which I, um, I referenced earlier yeah. in our, in our talk. And then, um, I do out of the Farkas book, the, um, the art of playing the French horn out of that there on page 60 and 61. Um, okay. there is, he calls it the lower octave, which I love because it's just the break range for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah. It's just an extra, it's a, a page and a half of exercises through that. And it's all, it's just two notes back and forth, but it's around the harmonic series. And I do it as written, which is all slurred. And then I go back and I do it all articulated. Um, I remember that from the first time we met. I remember yeah. asking you, I was like, hey, Denise, like, hey, Denise, like, <laughs> can, how can I get better in the low register? And like, I remember you talking about, this exercise specifically and yeah. it was it they're fifths so it starts on g g down to c and yeah. i think it's quarter notes d yeah it's eighth, eighth notes eighth it's like ba, da, 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 da. and then and you just keep going down like you start on open then you go to second then first then one and two two and three okay. and it's uh, it actually starts off on minor thirds and then it goes to major thirds then fourths and you go from there Okay. Um, so I guess, I guess I, I, I remember you talking about yeah. uh, that exercise. Yeah. I don't remember doing it's all that. Good. It's all good. <laughs> but when I do Busted. that exercise, my break range, which I think for most players is the weakest yes. part of, of their playing. Mm -hmm. um, once, if that's like, if I do that exercise, I feel fantastic about my break range. And then I usually do a couple of etudes and, um, and and things like that so that's honestly it's like it's making my face feel really good so i'm happy 
when that is happening. So it's not necessarily about learning new rep, although I am trying to, uh, you know, just kind of continually take, take a look at quartet stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, since that's a lot of music for me to learn. Because you are the new fourth horn of the American yeah. Horn Quartet. Yeah. Yay. It's a huge bravo. That's, that's yeah, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's a, I didn't know it was, uh, you know, on my bucket list, but apparently it was. I mean, those well, fourth horn parts are, I mean, crazy. out of this world. I mean, yeah. they were written for Charlie Putnam. Who, yeah. Like, I mean, you can go back yeah. and listen to all those recordings of the crazy. American Super Quartet that are just out of this world. Yeah. But I mean, it it's, truly sounds like a different instrument when he plays. I mean, it sounds yeah. like it's like a member of the trombone family, or, but it's yeah. like, but better. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, trombone players. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oops. I should yeah. have said that. But um, so <laughs> if we if we talk about that break register, you just said something that really uh, was interesting for me. You said if I the break register is the uh, kind of the hardest, the last one to develop, and the weakest. Yeah. And if I can get that feeling good, I feel good in all registers. Yeah. And um, first of all, could you describe? Tell us what the break register is for those of us who might not know, who might not be sure. Familiar. Yeah. Now I will say that um, there are there are some players uh, and teachers uh, that don't really feel like the break range exists. I wasn't exactly sure how to say that. Um, and there are some people that it's just such a gradual change that there's no specific place where a, yeah. a new sort of set locks in. And you know. I jokingly say that I that I don't like those people, but because uh, <laughs> my break is so um, pronounced, it's so pronounced. That was the best word for that. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, look, and there, and if if you're one of those people that it just slowly, you just slowly change, um, you know, from like a third space C all the way down to low C. Great, and you know, and if it sounds good, that's all that matters. But for the majority of players out there, there is a place where you have your high sets yeah. and then you have a place where your jaw is going to come out and the corners are going to come down a little bit. Some people a lot, like you want to talk about uh, fantastic frowns when they play Charlie Putnam, the most incredible frown when he plays. Wow. I mean, it looks like a caricature. It's fantastic. Oh, man. Um, but... Uh, so yeah, and, and what's, what's happening when you bring that jaw out is it allows the airstream to start to flow up a little bit and that's pretty much what needs to happen for the low range. Um, but for most people, it's going to be somewhere between G, the first note of Shostakovich, okay. the low 2D, mm -hmm. somewhere between that and the E above that, the, the bottom line of the treble yes. staff. Yeah, exactly. Mine's right on middle C, a little, maybe a little bit me, C, B, B flat somewhere in there yeah. and I can I can move it like if I need yeah. I can move it up to like a C sharp or a D or I could move it yeah. down if necessary as low as an A yeah yeah and I think for for most um, advanced players there is a range where you can play on both your high and your low when somebody is just trying to figure out where their break range is um, that then I try to make them be sort yes. of like draw a line in the sand yeah. because otherwise they're just going to constantly be cheating mm -hmm. and nothing's yeah. going to become solid. And then once we have it locked in place, then we can start to like become a little bit more flexible. Yeah. Um, and so what I would tell people that maybe if you don't know where that low set is, um, try playing a low B flat, like a uh, first note of Ein Helden Leben, something like that and come up chromatically slurred um, and you want to be sure that your jaw, you have good contact with your teeth, mm. and that the jaw is a little bit out. Some people drop straight down. Some people come straight out. Some people are in the middle. I'm in the middle. Mm. And I, I actually think that coming more out than down is helpful. But mm. again, we're not, nobody's made the same. So you do what sounds best. Yeah. And if you are on that in that register, if you've gotten to the point where you have no contact with your teeth and your lower lip is sort of rolling out this way, that means that um, you're not truly in your low set. You're actually trying to play down there on your high set. Wow. Um, and it's going to have what I've, a uh, technical term, what I call meow. Yes, I love that. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Scott, I, that I played drill. Day and I was like thinking yeah. about you. I was like, meow. <laughs> yeah. Got that meow well, sound. So, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, start from there. And if you have got that good contact, then bring that up and don't allow the contact to change. And you'll find a place where suddenly, could you hear that? That was my dog snoring. Oh, <laughs> I was amazingly loud. Oh, buddy. Um, but so, uh, yeah, you'll find a place where it just doesn't work anymore. And you're going to have to switch into what would be a more probably for you a normal place. Or yes. when I say you, you know, anybody. Yeah. Playing. Um, yeah. So that's that's you you know it's just where the where the because uh, we have a five octave range so it's like you know we've got a, we've got a place where it's got a got a break yeah exactly yeah well, tuba I, players have a similar thing i oh trumpets do as well no tuba, tuba. okay tuba. okay yeah so i was going to say that um it's really um, awesome to hear you talk about this in such detail and um i think it's also really you're so able to explain it which is really helpful so um, just for me, that was the last register to really develop, like right around my break. And yeah. so that's why I spend every day starting right around my break. And that's why yeah. I do long tones around my break. And it's just, yeah. you know, I work on that because it is really one of my weakest registers. But um, yeah. uh, could you tell a little bit about your journey and um, just um, from Columbus to Detroit, to Philly, to Peabody, to, uh, since yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, so yeah, so I mentioned, so I, I went to school at uh, in Boston at NEC, um, studied with Chuck Kowalowski, who was the principal horn there for many, many years. And I studied with him for three years, and then he took a sabbatical. And I studied with the tuba player in the Boston Symphony, uh, who at the time was Chester Schmitz. And everybody always asked, well, is that why you're you know, a great low horn player? No, not at all. And we didn't talk about technique. We talked about music 100% of the time. He's one of the most incredible musicians I've ever met. It's just beautiful, beautiful playing. So, um, and let's talk about somebody who had a lot of energy. His lessons would last however long the pot of coffee would last that he would bring in. He'd bring in a big pot of coffee. It's, it's like two and a half hours later, you're like, oh my God, I can't play anymore. But um, yeah, so that was my, my senior year there. Um, and then I took a year off from school. I, I never really wanted to get uh, an advanced degree. I was just not interested in that. Um, but I was with a wind quintet for a long time, many, many years, six, six seven years. And we did, uh, we got into the artist diploma program at NEC. And so uh, it's a two year program all about soloists and yeah. And so, but in the middle of that degree, I got into new world and I had to make a decision. Oh, wow. What do I want to do in my life? Do I want to do chamber music or do I want to do orchestra? And at the time, it was much more difficult to make it, in my opinion, as a chamber group. There was no social media. There was, it was just really hard to get your particular brand out. Yeah. So I thought, you know, for the, for the sake of um, eating, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know like why that's good, like, but eating, like, having a roof over your yeah, head, exactly. eating, yeah. Uh, then I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to New World, and and I will say that was leaving that group was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah, cause um, everyone, you know, that's like all for one, one for all, and it's like, yeah. hey, you know, we're all in this, but yeah. at a certain point, you just gotta say like, hey, like my career is going this direction, and I need to, you know, focus on this and. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough, like especially as like a, a new group that's trying to, you know, make it. Yeah. But Yeah, and we won uh we won a lot of the competitions out there, but it's just yeah, it was uh I I sort of saw the writing on the wall. So I went down to New World, I was there for three years. Then I was in Columbus for two years, and then I was in the Baltimore Symphony as second horn. It's the only position where I've uh, the only job where I was second horn instead of fourth. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three years and one would think that I started at Peabody at that point, but I did not. Um, so I, I won uh, Detroit, fourth in Detroit, and uh, Carl and I had known each other, Carl Pitock and I had known each other for many, many years uh, prior to that. We played in um, uh, the Colorado Music Festival together. And so it was really great to like be back playing in a section with him. 
Um, and I, I love that section. I love that orchestra. We love living in Detroit. You know, yeah. it's gritty. And, and I mean, that was back, I mean, what was it, the yeah. mid-2000s, you know, early yeah. 2000s, you know, and yeah. it was just like, yeah, Detroit, I remember, like, we used to go there in the 90s, right, to go see Tigers yeah. games. And, yeah. and then in the early 2000s, I'd go to, like, you know, some concerts, some, some shows. Yeah. And I remember, like, we'd go to, like, Greek Town, and then we'd go to, like, St. Andrew's Theater, or St. Andrew's Hall. Yeah. And that was about the state theater. We're just like, that's it. All right. I'll that's get it. back in the car, yeah. lock and the door, no. drive real quick. <laughs> yeah. like, Detroit yeah. was scary. But, and we lived. It's like so much better now. You know? Yeah. It's, it's and there, and like, we lived warm. about, um, we lived about a mile, maybe not even a mile from the stadiums. Uh, so we were like right in between the stadiums and, and Orchestra Hall. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I was there for six years and... That's a right. great section too. Uh, Dave, That's a great section. Yeah, I mean, Dave was. Yeah, like, Dave Everson, um, uh, Brian Kennedy. Um, at the time, it was Corbin Wagner. Now Scott is there. He's great. Joanna's great. Who replaced me? Um, Carl, uh, Mark. Um, yeah, they're all. It's just a, just a great section. And the uh, they get along really well. And too, right? Uh, their hall is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, so. Yeah, I think about Detroit as like, you know, it's one of those orchestras that's really a fantastic orchestra yeah. that, you know, um, probably, I don't know, I, I would love to hear them play more. And they yeah, have- Well, they, they do a, a, a webcast. So um, I, I feel like they did one every, or they do one um, every week. And I think right now you can still get on and, and hear a lot of, hear a lot of those back concerts. Awesome. So yeah, people should check that out because it's a great orchestra and great section. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was there six years. And so when I was talking about being in the American Horn Quartet and how I didn't know it was a bucket list item, one of the things I was going to say is I don't like to have goals. And I know that sounds maybe a little bit weird, but I'm more process oriented than goal oriented. No. Unfortunately, in my youth, um, my stupid youth, I got in my head, I got, I want to be in a top five orchestra. And that was starting to haunt me a bit because I was in, um, not a top five orchestra. I was very happy in Detroit. Um, and yet there was this nagging sort of thing. So I, I kept auditioning and got into the finals for Boston Symphony and uh, having gone to school there, I was really, really sad that I didn't get that job. And Philly was just uh, 12 days after that. And um, after that audition where that I didn't win, that nobody won. Wow. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I was just, it was really hard for me to practice and, and all of that. And I kept saying it was, and at, by this time I was already teaching at Peabody. So I was flying from Detroit to Baltimore every single week wow. to teach. And then I'd finish and I'd fly back home. Um, was that on like a Sunday? You'd fly on a Sunday and then you'd Yeah, we had Monday Sunday and... concerts. We had Sunday concerts. So then, um, so yeah, after the Sunday concert, I would go out to the airport. I would usually teach from like, nine to midnight or something like that on Sunday night. And then I'd get up and I'd do, you know, maybe 10 straight hours, like seven to seven to five or eight to six. I was like, somebody do the math for me. Oh. And then I would have like an 8.30 flight back. <clears throat> yeah, I was, oh. Oh I've God. always been a little bit insane, but that was probably the height of it. Wow. Um, wow. I mean, that's just like, it's impossible because you're just like so tired from uh, yeah. like playing a concert, like especially three, four concerts in a row. Yeah. And then like when you teach, like you really give a lot of energy. I mean, you like I, I teach a couple hours here or there and I'm just always surprised that like after an hour, I'm just exhausted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, it's crazy. Tough. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, the weekend that uh, Philly, the Philly audition was, it was like um, maybe spring break for Peabody. So I, I, if I didn't go to that audition, I wouldn't have had to travel. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just sit home? And, uh, and honestly, my husband was like, no, you've got to, you've got to do this. You've been preparing, like, just, just get on the airplane. Uh, okay, you know, so I get on the airplane and I go and I get to the hotel and I text him. I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to, um, 
just like not set an alarm, sleep in. I'm going to hang out in Philly for a couple of days. No, just set the alarm. All right. So I set the alarm. I get up. Yeah, I'm going to cancel. No, just do your warm up routine. So honestly, he like held my hand long distance through all of that until I got to the hall and I played and I was then and then I advanced and I was like, okay, now I'm in it to win it at this point. Wow. Um, so then then it was like, you know, my instincts kicked on and yeah. I was ready to go. So uh, yeah, I, I certainly was not anticipating winning that job. I, I, I thought I would be better suited playing wise to a Boston than a Philly, but my sound has some dark qualities to it. So I think it, I think it worked well at the, at the, the bottom of that section. And I was there for, uh oh, seven years, eight years. I don't know, something. I think eight. Yeah, I think. Well, I think that's it, right. I think I left. It was 2008 when you won that, that job. 2009, 2009, 2009. And I finished mm -hmm. in 17. Um, yeah. And so that it was just a nice train ride uh -huh. from Philly down to Baltimore, you know, 70 minutes on the train, I could do work, it was easy. Um, so I, I did that. And as time went on, doing that, um, it was basically like I had two full time jobs. And Philly's heavy, and they travel a lot in the summers and big, you know, international tours. And yes, and you know, it's just it's a heavy job. I love the job, but it was yeah. a heavy job. So and I really loved teaching and I still love, I don't know why I put that in the past tense, but talking in the past. So I love teaching and I was starting to do a lot of solo work and a lot of recitals and masterclasses around the world. And, and it was getting to the point where I was being asked to do things and I wasn't able to um, get out of Philly because it wasn't fair to the section, it wasn't fair to the orchestra. Yeah. So I had to, um, yes, Vincent, I agree. Thank goodness I was in Philly so we could meet. So, oh. <laughs> um, so uh, I had a decision to make I, and I was, I, my body was starting to not really handle the stress all that well. So through a lot of talking, uh, you know, with my husband, it was like, okay, I think I'm going to take a year leave of absence from the orchestra to figure out how do I feel teaching full time and not playing in an orchestra full time. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and honestly, it, it was a really hard decision. There was nothing easy about this decision. I know. Um, you know, you Philly Orchestra is like one of the yeah. best orchestras. Yes. In the country and, and the, certainly and in the world. I mean, that yeah. string section, as you said earlier, it's just like <laughs> being embraced by a giant hug. Yeah. And especially like, I mean, all the sections are great. Like the cello yeah. section, the, the violin section has this amazing legato, this like this shimmer that, I mean, really only you can get in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. and it's, I mean, there are other great string sections. I mean, the viola section is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, they're all virtuosos, like the bass yeah. section, they're just like, you know, obviously like you know, Hal and uh, Joe yeah. Conyers and yeah. all those guys. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, and winds and brass percussion, everybody's great. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, you know, and I'd, I'd reach that goal, you know, I yeah. wanted to be in a top five and I'd reach that goal. And then I got there and I was like, well, I, now I'm just too busy. I mean, it's, it, it sounds like I'm complaining. I'm not, it was a great, problem to have no i mean I, i'm there with you though i mean chicago yeah. i'm i'm really busy i don't have time yeah. for anything else i don't yeah. have time to really teach i don't really have time uh to do any solo or chamber it's just yeah. you know that's my job yeah I'm, yeah i'm happy and with that and while i have this break now i'm like really happy to you know have some projects like you know interviews yeah. but um right yeah, absolutely i i feel when you're in a job like that, it's just really, there's a lot of tours, a lot of rehearsals, yeah. a lot of music coming up every week, big concerts. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And you record, you record and, and yeah, it's, it's a lot. And, uh, and I was, like I said, I was like, you know, traveling, we would go on tour to Asia and I would give three recitals while on top of doing that, which anybody who's toured knows how weird your face feels and how bad you feel period. So, um, so I decided to take a year leave of absence from the orchestra just to see how, how would I feel not playing full time. Um, and so within a couple of months, and I had so many offers to go do other things, some play in orchestras. It was that year that I came and played with Chicago for the first time, um, sat next to Dale and played, uh, and played Rite of Spring and we rocked Horn 7 and 8. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so it's like I got asked to do a lot of orchestral playing, but also a lot of solo playing, a lot of master classes. So I was probably the busiest I'd been. Uh, it just wasn't 100% orchestral music. And honestly, by the time I got to about uh, late October of that year leave, I knew, I knew that I was, that this was the direction I was supposed to go. Um, but when I had to type that email, which I had to, I had to type the email in Jan late January, I had to give my decision. When I typed that email, I sat there, I wrote it and I looked at it and I had a drink and I looked at it <laughs> and I thought, Oh God, what am I doing? I got to the top of my field and now I'm going to walk away voluntarily. Yeah. And I thought, but I'm happier and I get to do a little bit more of what I want to do. And I can go back and sub in Philly and play with those great musicians, you know, um, whenever the orchestra wants me to, which has been great. So I hit send and I spent that night sort of grieving the, what my career, what my orchestral career had been and what I had worked for my entire adult life. Yeah. I've been working for that since I was probably about 17. And then I got up the next day and I was like, I feel great. Let's go. Um, so I, I gave myself that night to, to grieve. And I honestly, I, I haven't regretted it wow. once. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I, I just went on tour with Philly back in the fall to Asia. We had a great time. And oh, um, I was supposed to go play a, a show of Beethoven 8, Beethoven four and Beethoven seven. On, I was supposed to play that on second horn. We were gonna uh, all three in one concert, and then we were supposed to go to Carnegie. And then it was one yeah. of my first extra gigs to get canceled. But so yeah, so I was teaching full time, and uh, then at, at in Peabody, and um, there had always been a couple of schools that I thought, well, if they ever opened, you know, if the professor ever decided to retire, I would really be interested in that job. And CCM was one of those one of those uh, positions. And literally my first day of full-time work at Peabody, um, after having left the orchestra, I got, I got a call saying that Randy Gardner had decided to retire and would I be interested in interviewing for it? And I was like, oh my God, I, yes. You know, it's one of, so um, yeah. And it's, uh, we love Cincinnati. I love the school. The studio is fantastic. Uh, I enjoy working with everyone and, um yeah so it's I mean, been, it's been amazing great. amazing I, I just love hearing your journey and I love hearing your story but just also the fact that you had this thing that you thought was like you wanted and then you looked at it and you were able to say this is maybe not like what I ultimately wanted you know yeah. it's like you get there and you, you do it for a number of years or you know in my case I did Berlin for a year and yeah. I was just like you know it's you know I had to resign you know i resigned from berlin and it's again yeah. it's one of those things i did grieve for that you know it's like yeah. that's a it's a it's a tough thing to get to someplace that you always wanted and then say you know what i'm going to take a step back or do something different and you know ultimately um yeah those moments where we have losses or we have um yeah just unexpected you know turn of events from like what we planned i think those make us more resilient they make us more um deep musicians and they also uh make us a little bit more empathetic and made me a little bit more empathetic to like yeah. what other people are going through uh and you know just also i just feel like um more grateful like yeah. where i'm at today yeah you know so yeah and i think it it also helps us realize that goals change that life changes that um and i think that when you try to just stay true to one thing, even if it's not working, it's the, what I always say, it's like uh, when I was little, I had, a, I had a toy. I mean, when I was really little, I had a toy that had the shapes cut out in a, yes. in a block and you had to put the correct shapes in. It's like you took the octagon shape and you're trying to hammer it into the circle hole. And it's like, <laughs> well, that doesn't exactly work, but it's so close. Maybe I can just keep hammering at this. Um, <laughs> so it's like, you know, have the, have the courage to experience other things. And one of my mottos now is like, if it, if it scares me a little bit, playing wise, then that means that I need to do it because um, not performing 
four or five times a week in front of an audience can make your world small if you mm. let it. Yeah. Um, so I try to really put myself out there and push push my boundaries so yeah. that I, I stay mentally as healthy as I can. I mean, you've also had a bunch of commissions that you've been like active with. You've recorded a couple yeah. albums. Like yeah. you're doing a lot of like recitals and, and soloists, you know, performances. Yeah, so you're really, you are really pushing yourself and you're yeah. putting the, the repertoire and the boundaries of like, hey, like this is what we can do on the low horn and or yeah. the horn in general. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, uh, what advice would you give to students? Like, especially during this time of stay at home, you know, to like help challenge themselves, to help kind of like push themselves, maybe just to kind of get through the day, like to uplift themselves. Yeah. I think that there are, um, everybody has such a different way of making themselves happy on the instrument. And so some people like me are really happy when I'm working on sort of basic things and those things are going really well. And I feel like my face is working really well. So for me, the scales, my routine, and, um, you know, the Sparkus exercise, that makes my face happy. Therefore, I'm happy. Mm. Uh, but if that sort of stuff doesn't make you happy, you do need to do a little bit of it to make sure that you're warmed up and ready to go. But then play, work on some new pieces that you've always wanted to learn. Um, you know, if you want to learn how to do some jazz playing, then, you know, play along with the recording. And uh, one thing that I recommend for a lot of people who get sort of depressed during this time and we're not playing with other people is turn on a recording of your favorite orchestra or chamber music or jazz or whatever and play along and for some people it's okay to just turn it on on the computer or their stereo system or whatever and play with the speakers for others i say put on headphones so that you feel like you're a part of the orchestra um, and yeah. so that's a great way for people to sort of get out of their head and maybe feel a little bit of joy. But I feel like whatever makes you happy on the instrument, do that. Yeah. So that, you know, so that you continue to find the joy and the love in what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, but I also, I love the fact that you're like, I mean, if we liken this to a diet, you know, like, all right, what things do I eat that make me happy? Cookies, right? <laughs> Cake, you know? And so like, you know, I, I, would, I would go eat some cookies, but if I eat too much cookies, like, yeah. you know, that's gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna be so happy anymore. So that's yeah. where you say like, hey, work on the, the fundamentals, work on the scales, work on, yeah. on the farkas, uh, you know, kind of warm ups. Right. And, and that's like, you know, eating your vegetables or like, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, eating your spinach for lack of a better, you know, yeah. term. Yeah. Um, could you just give like a little bit of advice? Um, I don't know just for what stuff to work on you. I know you said the Chantal book. I know you said some like, uh, what, what would you, what solo would you, you know, recommend mm. for, for players that they might not. Yeah, I was already going to etude books. Okay. Um, Cause that's what I want to do is etude books. Uh, what solos? Well, it depends on what you want to work on. You know, do you want to work on your high range? And um, not that it's, it's very, high but you know you could work on something really traditional like Strauss one or Mozart two or four something very traditional um, if you want to work a little bit more on um, sort of mm, louder playing but a little bit more block oriented you could do a little bit of uh, Hindemith, Hindemith sonatas either yes. one is you know really nice for that if you want to work on the, some low range um, we were talking about all the commissions that I've done Four of them are available for purchase and another six will be hopefully in a few months. Um, yeah, so there, there are just so many great pieces out there. I, I think do a lot of listening, do a lot of listening and see what makes you happy and what excites you. Yeah. You know, lyrical playing, do Gliere, you know, yeah, it's, for it's sure. just so much, so much great music out there. Yes, Bagatelle. I, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> in our last minute, could you just talk about why music is so important and the arts are so important right now? Well, I think that um, anything that we uh, watch on TV or experience has some kind of art in it. It's all, it's all art. So without art, we would have nothing to watch or listen to. I think that it can make us happy. I think yeah. it can give us a little bit of peace. You know, it can soothe us a bit. So um, 
I think it's really important not only for us to enjoy and um, digest that, you know, to hear music, to to watch beautiful film, to a lot of art museums have uh, free online. You can go and like tour the art museum. Me, we're we're going to end. I'm going to okay. restart this. Hey, we we're just finishing up our chat with Denise Tryon, who is uh, one of my favorite horn players, one of my best friends, and um, yeah, she's also a phenomenal low horn player, soloist, and uh, we we're just finishing up hearing her thoughts about um, music and I'm gonna go online so we can finish this conversation. It's been such a pleasure having uh, the morning with Denise and getting to see her again and uh, yeah, getting to share fun stories and hear all about the commission she's doing and also, you know, to see her puppy. It's just a, a six month old French bulldog. So really happy uh, we got to see uh, her, her new addition to her family. Hello to Melody from Taiwan. Hello, Klaus Fair. Hello, Jeff Nelson. Um, hello, Liam McCoon. We're waiting for Denise to go live here. Uh, hello, Maestro Kan uh, Um And let's see, we've got Stephen Foe. We've got uh, Vargas, Dante, Daniel, Four Flutes, One Eye. We've got a lot of folks on today. Tech Horn, Rose Horn, five others. Frank Demler from Berlin. Hey, good to see you, my friend. Oh, man, we're just waiting for this technology to really, oh, man, bummer. Okay, let's see if we can go on one more time. I don't know why this is technology for me. I'm telling you, it just always, uh... hey, there we are. Hey, there sorry. we go. I, I don't know. I, I hit the connect button and it just was like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> and I tried to request and it was like, nope. <laughs> so your thoughts so, about, you know, music and entertainment just being like, uh, I mean, music and arts are everywhere. It's TV. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, on our recordings, it's, you know, radio, it's everything that we do to entertain ourselves and to really, um, you know, think and to feel uh, and to express is just the arts. But I forget where, um, where you left off exactly. You were just... Uh, yeah, I think we were talking about, um, like, you know, art museums have all these free online, uh, you know, opportunities for you to go experience uh, what they have. Uh, and I think that it's not only important to like experience that so that you're watching and listening, but part of what we love about music is sharing it with others. So if that is creating acapella videos with your friends, if that yeah. is uh, going live, uh, you know, on social media and sharing that, and it's not about playing perfectly, you know? I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you like, for the whole first half of this interview, I was just thinking about like, all right, so before you joined, I tried to play the Star Wars thing and like, <laughs> I, I completely like splatted the high B flat. And I was like, that's embarrassing. I wonder if I could edit that out. And I was like, you know, I'm human, you know? It's like, yeah. hey, it happens like, you know, I mean, even like, I, I don't know. I mean, it happens to all of us. Let's just say that. But it's like, you know, you like, you go yeah. for like the, you know, the high note and Strauss one on occasion or yeah. uh you know Schumann Adagio Allegro and I remember yeah. there was a student it, that I mean in I did a master class in Beijing a few years ago and I, I had a student who you know missed the high B flat and he just he started crying and yeah. I remember thinking like man it's not that big of a deal right yeah. it doesn't make us a good person doesn't make us a bad person to miss a note you know, and no one's perfect, like, you yeah. know, especially me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not perfect. But the thing is, is like, when I have those mistakes, it's like, okay, like, what can I learn from it? All right, well, maybe like, you know, don't just pick up any horn and try to hit the high B flat, like pick up your <laughs> horn. If you want to like, hit the, the high B flat for your like, you know, for your concert, don't use the horn you warm up on in your apartment, like put yeah. together, take the time to put together your concert horn that you, you practice on, you play everything with. And, you know, yeah, it's and then also too like, hey, like maybe practice it before you just pick it up and just, you know, play it. Yeah. Well, and I, for me, um, I don't allow my students to say the word perfect. It's mm -hmm. one of my, it's one of my no-nos. 
Um, and one of the questions that we had talked about, you know, that yeah. we didn't get to, but I might now that we're in a second hour. Yeah, might, yeah absolutely. Um, is uh, how do you, I don't remember, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but like, how, how can you be happy when you have a performance that maybe isn't up to your standards or yeah. something along those lines? So for me at this point, the only Hmm. I just said I wasn't necessarily goal oriented. The only goal I have, sorry, self, uh, is that I want to go for the music. I don't want to let the fear win because sometimes we miss notes because we start thinking about, oh, that I've missed that note before. I got to be sure to hit that note. And mm -hmm. instead of just playing great music. And I think that when you think about your favorite players in the world, when you hear them live, they miss notes. You know, yeah. or if it's a string player, it's, they don't have, you know, always spot on intonation or, you know, uh, shifts or something like that. Um, it's about creating great music. And so what you walk away from those performances thinking is, God, that was just so great. You might not even remember the missed notes. Yeah. So for me, the only time I'm unhappy when I walk off stage is if I let the fear win. Mm. That's the yeah. only time I'm unhappy. And I, and and I, and I can honestly say that. I mean, I'm sure there have been performances that, well, not I'm sure. I always know there are things I can do better. I'm always looking to be a better player. But if I do great music and I don't let the fear win, I'm super happy. Yeah. And I think for me, great music, like I have to like ask myself, what is great music? Yeah. And for me, great music is great communication. Yeah. It's having a great plan. It's having a great story. It's having, you know, really practiced... It's having like, um, I, I know those moments where I want to change the color or I want to, you know, try to really draw the listener in by playing something soft or yeah. I take a risk and it really like pays off or I take a risk and maybe it doesn't go exactly as planned, but I'm able to still convey that emotion yeah. and that effect. Yeah. yeah. I would always like to listen to somebody who takes some risks and maybe, you know, misses a few than somebody who tries to play note perfect and doesn't take some risks and doesn't really say something and communicate with me um, because it's, that's boring. For yeah. me, it's just not, it's not interesting to listen to. So uh, I'll, always, I'll always take those risks and sometimes they'll pay off and sometimes they won't. And then when it doesn't, I know what I need to work on in order to make sure that it pays off the next time. Yeah, so we go back to the lab and we like, you know, we look at the okay. experiment, we look at our notes and we say, okay, maybe let's add a little bit less of this or a little bit more of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that for me is like something that it impresses me about you is that like, you're really like, all right, or, you know, any, really any top level player, like they, they play something and then they go back and they self examine, they remember, they say, all right, where did this go well, where did this maybe not go so well? Yeah. And, and what can I do to uh, change some of the variables or how can I practice this different? So, yeah. you know, and, you know, for me, when I play, I was doing a lot of recitals before I was getting ready for Berlin. Yeah. And I remember like, I'd fix the one thing, uh, you know, from the night before and then something else had happened. So I'd fix that the next day. <laughs> you know, it's like you're patching holes in the dance. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you got your toes up here. Like, yeah, but it's like, you know, I, I'd fix one hole and then, you know, I'd find yeah. another hole and then, you know, kind of, and, the the most fun I had during that whole string of you know nine recitals that I was doing and I was just playing Strauss four, uh, one and Mozart four, but um, I went to a cafe and I was playing in like a, a like a bar where they were like people were serving like food and drinks and they were yeah. having conversations while I'm playing Strauss one and while yeah. I'm playing Mozart four. And I just remember thinking like, man, I got to compete with people's food and drink. Like this is like, or their conversation. And like, yeah. I, I've never been in a classical situation where people are talking. And it was so cool because like, it really made me say like, all right, if I want to engage with them, I have to really engage. Yeah. If I really want their attention. I really have to entertain. Yeah. And I really have to, I have to say something now. And that, yeah. that's where it was like, okay, now it can't be about no perfect. It's got to be about yeah. that communication and that entertainment. Yeah. Yeah, and when I, <clears throat> one, one thing that sort of um, got me over the hump of winning that, that top five job for me was giving recitals. And that's, um, I gave my first recital in like 15 years, right before uh, getting to the finals of Boston and winning Philly. And when I was 
preparing that recital, I wanted to do things in the low register. And that's when I started realizing, wow, there's really just not a lot of music out there. And that's how the whole commissioning thing started. But <clears throat> I do remember that, um, and I don't know if Carl's still on at this point, but he was, in, it was like afterwards, Carl said, wow, you seemed really relaxed. I was like, oh, wow, because I was really nervous, you know, and, and I'm, per usual Denise, I acted like an idiot and I sort of made a face and I put my knees together, you know, I was standing. Luckily, I wasn't holding my horn because I dislocated my knee at that point and went down and everyone thought I was still just like being funny until they realized that I stayed down and I'm like screaming in pain and hitting my knee trying to get it to go back on. <laughs> you know, so, first recital in 15 years, you dislocated your knee. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what I have now learned through a few, you know, through all of that is when I get kind of tense about something, when I'm holding tension, the place I'm holding it is in my legs. Yes. And that's why, and that's why my kneecap, well, I mean, I have problems with my knees anyways, but that's why my kneecap sort of went off. Uh, yeah. says it, was funny, it was funny at first. At first. <laughs> oh my gosh. I fell down like a sack of potatoes. It was just sad. <laughs> it was funny at first. It was funny at first. <laughs> oh man! Okay, um, yeah, I think you know yeah. our body tension. Though that's like one of the things where like we can really improve our sound. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, a couple of weeks ago, like I was playing something in the low register. I was playing Shostakovich five, and it wasn't. Um, you know, there were some areas that I was like not super happy with, and so of course, you know, me wanting to learn, I want to go to somebody that actually you know does that thing really well. And so I, I sent you a text and said, Denise, help. And you're like, do you really want my help? And I, was I, like, I was like, you're joking, right? And he's yeah, like, I was like, no, no, really. And I'm like, uh, and then you called me. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah, I was like, it, but I, I felt like I was like, man, I just got all these like little bits of things to chew on for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like food for thought. You go to like someone that does something better than you. And you're just like, hey, like, I have no shame saying like you play like the low register, like amazing. And I need help in that. And so like, I went to you and you, you talked about tension. You talked yeah. about like releasing tension in my, in my tongue. Yeah. In your also, tongue. Yeah. And also, and also, and also on the upper lip. Um, yeah. yeah. So tension and somebody just asked, what are my, what are my tips for Shasko Chai? But so, uh, so I'll talk about it a little bit, but I will say that I do have a YouTube video on Shostakovich five. So awesome. check that we'll out. Watch it. But, we'll watch that. Um, but, for for me, when I hear that sort of round sound, it means that either the person's got a tense tongue, and what that is causing is the air, it, it makes the airstream go get a bit faster. Because usually when you have a tense tongue, it's like up and, you know, and it's causing the airstream to be a bit faster. So the sound has more high overtones than you maybe want. Um, and then the other thing is that the lower you go, the more relaxed your upper lip is going to be. You still want your corners to be firm. But the, for me, when I'm in, like, let's say that the low B flat that's in Shostakovich 5, for me, it's almost like the tuba size mouthpiece. All of that part of my upper lip is really, really relaxed. And often people are trying to, like, grip the airstream with their upper lip. And that's a kind of... Um, uh, a, a kind of control. And anytime you're trying to control anything in your life, it usually doesn't work. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So just, just letting it go and let the air do the work. The air is the gasoline of the car. Let the air do the work and your chops can kind of steer it like the steering wheel. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that really helped me get a better sound. It really helped me. I mean, after we talked, I was able to play like that, like middle, that middle low register and the low register on Shostakovich five on F horn and I yeah. was like, and have a great sound. And I was like, yeah. man, like that range from like the G down to the B flat, I was able to play all that stuff. Yeah. On. Yeah. Yeah. And you want, you want a little bit of a slower airstream, a little bit warmer airstream. If the airstream is too fast or too cold, then again, you're going to get too many of those high overtones and it's, it's going to be, you're going to get the real tension in the sound. Yeah. Uh, um, someone asked about uh, releasing the, the tongue. Releasing the tongue, yeah. The tongue. So in that register, I think more of a though, a T-H-O, um, and just as if I would sing it so that the tongue isn't pulling back super fast, because then I feel like I'm getting 
I always say it feels like I'm getting slapped in the face when I'm listening to somebody who does that. Um, and I, you know, for me, I want the vowel to, that's the most important thing because that's the, that's the body of the sound. Yeah. So I don't want to add a super hard tongue to that. Now that's me because for me, articulation is led more by the air than by the tongue. That's my yeah. approach. So, um, so I'll try singing yeah. it with a, with a though in there. And as I get higher, I'll, I'll switch to something else, but down there, I'm going to think more of a though. Amazing. Wow. Um, uh, do you have any fixes for like a shaky sound? Cause that's, mm. I mean, I, I, it's not something that I've ever, uh, dealt with. Hmm. Uh, that's like, that's something that I, 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 I never, I, I just don't know about that. That was just something that like, I, I just came to mind. I was like, well, you seem to really have like a clear fix to the low register. That is another problem that like I've had students come to me with and I just haven't been able to fix. So does, is shaky sound mean in the low register or anywhere? Anywhere. Yeah. Just a, a little bit of quiver in the sound. So I think there are two things that are, that are coming into place. One is not having enough contact with the, with the lower teeth. For mm -hmm. me, that's the, that's the foundation, that's the touch point. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually, I have like a bit of a callus on the inside of my lower lip where, you know, where it, it gets pressed against the teeth. Yeah. Um, so I bring the jaw out a little bit to meet the mouthpiece so that I, I don't have to play with where my jaw, where my natural bite is. Okay. So I bring the jaw out to meet mm -hmm. it and that gives me that foundation where I can kind of sink into that. Um, and then usually with, a, with the shake, it's then after that, it's either that the corners aren't firm enough or mm -hmm. that your lip and your air are like fighting to see who is the, the, who's in control of the situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, and for me, it's about letting go of that tension here. And depending on where, you know, if it's low register, it's a bigger amount of mm -hmm. upper lip. If yeah. it's higher it's smaller amount but it's still you want that that inside part to be relaxed um and if it's not relaxed it's like fighting you know it's mm -hmm. like fighting that uh that air that's trying to get out so just so just let the air um take the take the lead and go from there okay uh can i ask a couple other technical specific questions yeah all right so uh have you ever like heard anyone that has the leak in their in their corners mm -hmm. like what do we what do we do for that um well yeah that probably means that um that right on the outside of the mouthpiece is just not quite firm enough so usually i'm looking around for a piece of paper but of course i'm sitting in a very strange position um maybe on your music stand is there one or no but there is uh the back of a book so i can always just write on that yeah I'll take my shantle. Oh man, I feel I feel honored that you're uh, you're writing on your shantle. <laughs> that I'm gonna write on my shantle. This was the very first book I owned, and it cost five dollars and ninety five cents. That's how long I've had it. Oh my gosh, I don't know how much mine was. It probably says on the back. I <laughs> it probably does. No, not my edition. I don't think. Man. Yeah. All right. It's important to, uh, to, for everyone to understand that I am not an artist. <laughs> it's really important to understand this. I'm married to one, but I am not one. Okay. So there's the embouchure. Woo! Yeah. Right? There's a nose. Yeah, there's okay. The this is our, our sort of corners, right? Yes. Okay. And we all know that we want our chin to come down, be nice and firm, but everything else needs to be pointing. Whoa, that's hard to do when you can't see your own anything. Yeah. Um, but it, everything else needs to be pointing towards the aperture and towards the, towards the mouthpiece. Okay. So um, if it's, if that's not happening, you might want to look to see is your, is your upper lip being pulled this way? Are you more snarling? Okay. You know, you can see what's happening here or um, you know, are you sort of pointing down this way? And my students are trying to get me to laugh at a particular, at a particular phrase that they keep writing in here. And I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together. There's a particular phrase where I lose my cookies, uh, just laughing hysterically. All right. So, um, uh, so that's, that's one thing. And I would try to practice just with the, um, just with the free buzz, just to see if you can, you know, is it really super wide taking up the whole thing or can you focus it in a bit? Okay. 
Oh, all right. And I think, man, there was one other question I was thinking of. I can't think of it off the top of my head. If I can't, if I think of it later on down the road, I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, was it the, the shake? It wasn't the, no, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. It's something that I, I just, I encounter occasionally with like with horn students and I just haven't really uh, had it. I mean, but the, obviously the shaky playing in the league yeah. are kind of something. Um, yeah. The, the thing is I, I, um, I get asked a lot of technical questions about the embouchure and I think it's uh, mostly because, and of course people don't know this when they're asking me this, but I've done four embouchure changes in my life. Wow. I mean, me personally, you know, to, you know, uh, I've been, led through four armature changes. And, um, and so I've had to learn a lot about the armature through that process. Yeah. And uh, it's really, it's for me, it's, I'm incredibly fascinated by the armature. I remembered it. Hey, there we go. Du All right, double buzz. Oh, double, double buzz. buzz. Double buzz. Okay, so for what most people, yeah, for most people, double buzz happens in one of two areas for most people, either right around the bottom of the staff, treble staff, around like E or G, or the other people are around third, third space C, huh. somewhere in there. And um, uh, for me, it's right around the bottom of the staff, Moy, especially E flat. So if I play Tchaikovsky 4 and if the conductor plays it a little bit too slow, in my opinion, or is really <laughs> egging us on to play loud um by the time we get to the end of of Shostakovich, uh, Shostakovich, Tchaikovsky 4 I'm going to be double buzzing like a crazy person so when it's happening in the um like in a in a performance or something where you just need to keep playing you just take five or maybe ten percent off of your volume you'll stop double buzzing oh okay if it's happening consistently when you're playing loud or because um, usually it only happens when you're tired, like the uh -huh. aperture has just gotten blown out yeah. too much. So, um, but if it's happening for some people, it just happens. Like I had a student, a couple of students throughout my, my time teaching that it just, every time they got to a certain note, it just happened. So what I found is that your something is a little bit too low or too open so either the jaw is a little bit too open and that's dragging the aperture open it could be that the tongue is a little bit too low and therefore the airstream is a little too slow for the for the note that you want to be hitting mm -hmm. and it's causing some things to to fight um, mm -hmm. but something is just a little bit too open yeah. So I usually tell people, try closing your jaw, you know, one or two millimeters. It'll feel like a lot, but it's not. And it usually stops for people. Huh. Okay. Um, and All the right. other thing yeah. is that if this is the note, it could be that the airstream is feeling like this and you want the airstream to feel more like this mm. onto the note. Yeah, that it's a conflict. Down. Yeah, it's a conflict. Yeah. yeah, of airstream versus lip. Wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, and Spencer asked, have you ever yeah. Um, yeah. dealt with any tension or pain? I have not, but I do know people that do. And I think there are a couple of factors. One, I would ask you, are you wearing a mouth guard when you sleep? Sorry, this is gonna get very personal here. Yeah. Um, I think, I personally think that all wind and brass players should be wearing a mouth guard when they sleep. And I'm not talking about a retainer to keep your teeth straight. I'm talking about the big old like super attractive mouth guards um, because our livelihood depends on our jaw and our teeth. And so for me, um, I, I grind my teeth pretty heavily when I sleep, I always have. And so mm. I have to wear one. Mm. Um, and if anyone's gonna have jaw problems, it would be me because I grind my teeth plus, you know, I'm sticking my jaw out all the time when I play low. And I have not, you know, knock on wood, I have not had any issues. Um, but that's the first thing I would ask is if you are wearing hey, where a mouth do you guard. Find, where do you find one of those? Just yeah, you, your dentist is going to, you know, really, really good, well-made ones are dentist. Your dentist makes it. Mm. Um, but honestly, if it's made well uh, and you're not somebody who grinds their teeth all the time like I am, it, uh, it probably should last you the rest of your life. Mm. Um, for me, I have to get it remade about every... 10 years because because I grind through it. Yay. Uh, but if you want to, you know, see how you feel, you can go to any, um, sorry, I'm going to talk in the United States here, but you can go to like a CVS or Walgreens or something like that. And they have, they're really big, but you, 
it's like you warm them up either by putting them in warm water or in the microwave or something and then you can bite down on it and then it has your your teeth your imprint yeah. in there and then i mean it's really the, those are really chunky the ones that are made by a dentist are not quite as bulky hmm. but that's the first thing i would suggest um, the next thing I would suggest is doing some some stretches and some exercises. So a great one. And if you have problems with your jaw clicking, definitely talk to your dentist first. But a mm. great one is to stick your jaw out all the way out. And then this is going to get attractive and then open with it stuck all the way out. And you oh. can feel that that muscle around there relaxing. And then you can uh, massage that muscle. And yeah. then the other thing is that the, the neck, the muscle here kind of comes around and connects in here. So give a good massage to that, whether that's with a tennis ball or your fingers or something before you go to bed every night to see if that helps. Yeah. And just do some regular stretches too. Like, you know, yeah. some, you know, like, yeah. right. Like Stretch your toes, your... right. Like right. roll down yeah. your spine and see if you can yeah. just keep articulate that spine. Yeah. Yeah, man. This is, I mean, so informative. Thank you so much for, for yeah. these, these answers. Uh, yeah. I just, I know that you know a lot about the horn and, you know, I just, I get really excited about um, just talking about some of the details, yeah. I guess. Um, lastly, like, you know, just mentally, like auditions are kind of a beat down. Right. And like, you know, I, I feel like one of my big things is that I've done a lot of auditions and I've had learned how to become resilient uh, after some of these, like, you know, not technical successes. Like, I mean, success is how you, you define it right right so i could define like uh, not an audition win as a success by learning something yeah so um but it's still you know it, it's one of those things you i was hearing someone talk about music the other day or like re read an article and it was um they were talking about music is such a thing where we put our hearts on our sleeves right like we expose ourselves to this vulnerability when we're on stage yeah. Yeah. We really like, you know, share our soul with the world. And like when it gets rejected in an audition situation, like sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Yeah. So how, how can you talk to students about getting over some of these defeats? Well, what I, um, what I say to my students and what I now live by, I didn't live by this when I was younger. It took me a while to get to this, to this point, but um, every time you step on stage and uh, anytime you're playing for somebody else, that's in a lesson, that's in a master class, that's a recital, that's an audition, anytime you're playing for somebody, the goal is to represent the player that you are. Everybody's mm -hmm. got some things that they do really well and everybody's got some things that they need work on. So if you can get to the point of representing the player that you are, after that, it's all it's like the icing on the cake. So after that, the win is going to come. The, the successes, you know, traditional successes are going to come. But if you're getting to the, if you're not at the point where you can represent your own playing when you step in front of somebody, yeah. that's the work that you need to do because you're not going to advance if you're not representing the player that you are. Oh my gosh. I mean, like the way you just said that was so clear for me because it's like when I go to these auditions and I really come back and I, I like, if I haven't like, played how I want to play yeah. right and I know I can play better than that and I went out there and I just bombed it because a I wasn't prepared or b I was nervous yeah. or c there was some extraneous factor that I wasn't aware of and that's yeah. when I get really down is because it was like these things were seemingly in my control yeah yeah and you the only thing and for a long time when I was first auditioning because it took me a long time to advance just even my first time I think it was like audition eight for me was the first time I advanced. Um, and then, and they decided to take the screen down in the sem that was the semi round. And I got so nervous that I was, I was shaking so bad that all of my comments were, please relax. We want to hear you play well. And I was like, I want to hear me play well too. Yeah. Um, but I, oh no, I got myself off topic. Um, if, well, all I was trying to do in those early auditions was please the committee. Mm. You know, play in such a way that they'll like me and they'll pick me. And that you have, it's, as in life, you have no control over if somebody likes you or not. Yeah. It's not something that you can control. 
So I decided to stop giving my power to other people and put it back inside myself. So wow. the things I can control are my preparation. Yeah. I can control um, my, the musical ideas that I want to say. Uh, I can control, hopefully, what you eat on that day if you prepare really well. Um, sleep. I mean, you know, the, like the amount of sleep, you know, exercise, all of that stuff. And uh, if you do all of that and you're able to then play how you play in the practice room, then that's a win as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, yeah, so I stopped, as soon as I stopped almost caring what the committee thought of me and started just trying to represent what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it, then everything started turning around. And I, I honestly can't believe all the things that have come to me when I stopped caring about what was happening out there. And of yeah, course, I mean, you want people to like what you do, but, you know. It was that, that saying that you said very opening in our, in our talk today. You were just saying, like, listen, I'm not going for results. I'm not going for the goal. I'm going for, like, you know, really, like, the work. Yeah, the process. Yeah, the process, you know, it's yeah. the journey, not the destination. Yeah. And that's yeah. amazing. And I think now, better than ever, we have the time for the journey. Right? Yep. So, yeah. yeah, I just think that's a really great place for us to kind of leave off if you're, you know, yeah. if you're okay with that. I mean, thank Absolutely. you so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's so great to talk to you. I miss you. You're like one of my dear friends and yeah. you know, obviously like one of my heroes on the, the horn. It's just awesome, really. Well, I'm, I'm so happy for everything that, you know, everything that's happening with you. That's just amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hey, let's, yeah. uh, let's stay in touch and maybe we can do a little duet project. Yeah, maybe. Okay. <laughs> let's, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We've got, uh, you know, some projects in the work. So. All yeah, right. Sounds good. Okay. I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.